Okay, um, you're talking today about subordinate clauses. Subordinate clauses are the, cla the clauses of phrases that are not main sentences or they come after a main phrase. The classical uh, orthodox German phrase based on subject verb object. That's what we often encounter as, and saw subject verb object. For example, when I say, uh, let's say, when I say Jennifer learned Deutsch. In a phrase like that, I have a subject, a verb, and an object. This is a classical German phrase, which we otherwise call it as SVO phrases. <coughs> so, not every German phrase or any other in the European uh, phrase might have three pillars. So this is a full sentence, but sometimes we have also phrases that has just two parts of speech. For example, when I say, um, let's say, um, John lacht, right? John is laughing, I don't have a third part. I have just the subject and the verb. As you see, I have just the first part and just the second part. So the subject and the verb. So when I say, for example, um, uh, Mike schläft, Mike is sleeping, or Mike sleeps, again I have just two parts in the phrase, I don't have three parts. But our reference is now a full phrase that has all the elements that we need for a complete phrase. A subject, a verb, and an object. As you see, and that is our actually main focus today, the verb takes the second position. So in a normal German phrase, we have verb always in the second position. This is what we have always to be in thought when we are creating um, normal uh, declarative phrases. It means informative phrases that they don't bring any doubt, they are not a question, they are not commanding forms, imperative, um, they are not um, exclamation phrases like to say how beautiful or something like that. So it means a normal uh, informative um, a statement, a declarative statement, uh, consists of this part, a subject, a verb, and an object. This is the thing that we have always to think about that when we are creating a phrase in German. Now, uh, there are exceptions or there are situations in which we cannot uh, go according to this um, classical structure. So, and the phrases are scrambled. So these are situations when we have subordinate clauses. It means not a main phrase. This is a main phrase, but sometimes we have a subordinate phrase. What are the subordinate phrases? We actually um, divide them into four different situations. Under four circumstances, four circumstances the word comes not in the second. So, um, for example, if I have a, um, um, conjunction that connects the first part to the second part. So that's why we call them conjunctively initiated subordinate, um, clauses. What the, it's, it's a quite complicated term, but if you see that in a phrase, it's much more easier to see that. For example, if I say a phrase like the man welche ein rotes Auto hat. 
the man, welche ein rotes Auto hat. So a man who has a red car. As you see, in the second part of the phrase, I have shifted from a main phrase to a subordinate phrase, and the related pronoun here, the conjunction or the conjuncture, which means who, brings a modality to the phrase, brings a change to the phrase. The word comes at the very end. So, um, or, for example, a phrase like so-called das setze. For example, ich weiß, das Mike Deutsch Sprich Ich weiß, dass Mike Deutsch Sprich What does it mean? Any suggestion? I know that Mike speaks German Exactly So I have two phrases And there is a conjunction here And this conjunction which we call it in German das setze, which means das phrases, leads that the second, or causes that the second phrase will have the verb at the very end of the sentence. So I know that Mike speaks German. So often after the phrases I know, I consider, I believe, I think, I perceive, phrases like that, we have a subordinate clause where the word comes at the end. For example, I can say, Ich glaube, dass heute warm wird. Ich glaube, dass heute warm wird. Ich glaube, dass heute warm wird. Jessica, what could it mean? Do you know that? Can you translate it to me? Exactly. I believe that today will be warm. This is also a subordinate clause because I'm talking about the perception that I have. I don't know really if, whether, whether it happens or not, but my perception, my impression, my um, overall consideration is that the weather today will be warm. And this is also a das phrase. Okay? So, um, <clears throat> is it just, sorry. Yes, sure. Is it, um, is the fact that it's das or the fact that it's no, the it's the fact or of das. Okay. Yes. That's why we call them das, das setze. Exactly. We call them das in German. We call them das setze, which means das phrases. It means every phrase that comes after das has to have the verb at the end of the phrase. Um, ich glaube is not the one and only, or ich weiß is not one and only initiative phrase that. Um, follows by das and has subsequently the, the verb in the second position, in the third position, we might have also other examples. For example, if I say, ich denke, das Deutsch eine starke Sprache ist. Ich denke, dass Deutsch eine, eine starke Sprache ist. And often, preceding we put das, we have to use a comma here. Ich denke, dass Deutsch eine starke Sprache ist. Mm -hmm. Delora, can you translate it mm -hmm. to me again? Uh, I know das. I uh, think. Mm -hmm. uh, ich, I think. Uh, I think uh, Deutsch, uh, German, uh, is, is uh, eine strong language. Strong language. Exactly, I think that German is a strong language. So as you see, uh, all phrases that start with a kind of perception, like ich glaube, ich weiß, ich denke, or for example, ich finde, das Los Angeles, Eine schöne Stadt 
ist. Ich finde, dass Los Angeles eine schöne Stadt ist. Todd, what does it mean? Uh, I find that Los Angeles is a lovely or beautiful city. Exactly. You see that it is always about so-called uh, perceptive phrases or um, so-called um, impressional phrases. When you're talking about your impression, whether you say ich weiß, I think, I know, ich glaube, I believe, ich denke, I think, ich, find, ich finde, I, I find a thing or I perceive, we are always talking about our impression um, from outside. Okay? So, um, so, and all of them, without an exception, they have this das. You see that? What just gives us the hint that the verb has to come at the end is das. Right? For sure, um, already, ich weiß, ich denke, ich glaube, ich finde, would give us already the leading to that. And the, the first um, hints to that, that it, it follows by a das, but um, if I would not use das, I don't need to scramble the phrase, putting the verb at the end. I can say, um, ich glaube, heute wird warm. Ich denke, Deutsch ist eine schöne Sprache, or ich finde, Los Angeles is an Stadt. If I wouldn't use das, I would not be able to put the verb at the end of the phrase. It means the main um, reason why we do use the verb at the end is because we are using here das. That's why in German we call them dasses. So that was the first uh, situation in which we have to push uh, the verb from the second position toward the third position. It means at the end of the phrase. And actually it doesn't matter how many uh, parts of speech we are dealing with in a phrase. A phrase might have a, a longer part, might have a direct object, indirect object, might have adjectives, adverbs, further prepositions and information, doesn't matter. We have to think about that, that the verb has to come always toward the end. So, okay, that was the first situation. That was about a conjunctively uh, initiated uh, subordinate clauses. So that comes often after the form das. Maybe. So das. We're going to work on that based on our um, assignments that we had it from the last week. So um, the second situation are initiated desire phrases. When I'm talking about a wish, a desire, something that I would like that would be materialized or actualized, and, um, and it would start often with nur or wenn, these two words, nur or wenn, and please don't mix it up with van, which is a question. I don't mean that one. So uh, phrases like that start with this would have also the word by the end. For example, if I would say, wenn ich ein schönes Haus hätte. Wenn ich ein schönes Haus hätte. So this is a wish site phrase. This is a, actually a, a subjunctive, is, is a subjunctive form. It's not a real phrase. This is an um, actually um, irreal wish that at the status quo right now is not actualized. Wenn ich ein schönes Haus hätte, Jessica, could you translate it? When I would have, right? It's a subjunctive form. It is not a real phrase. Mm -hmm. When I would have, right? Mm -hmm. When I would have a beautiful house, right? Um, or? When ich nur ein bisschen besser Deutsch könnte. 
Is a little bit uh, more complicated, but think about that. Wenn ich nur ein bisschen besser Deutsch sprechen könnte, this is also a wish for us, right? This is actually a desire, um, actually subordinated clause that follows by a main clause. What would I do if I would know that, right? So, does somebody, could somebody translate this phrase maybe? Wenn ich nur ein bisschen besser Deutsch sprechen könnte. If I ever could, mm -hmm. uh, speaking, yeah, uh -huh. speak speak English. English. a little bit better, better German. German, exactly. Just if I could speak a little bit better German. So it means, it, it implies that my status quo of knowing German is not as I, I wish, so it's a wish phrase. So for example, I can say, wenn ich nur ein bisschen besser Deutsch sprechen könnte, würde ich nach Deutschland reisen. For example, right, I would travel to Germany. So or, these are phrases where something comes after. Absolutely, they are wish phrases because, and that's why they are subordinate phrases. And these phrases often start with wenn or nur. For example, I could say, maybe a phrase like, wenn heute ein schönes, warmes Wetter wäre. Wenn heute ein schönes, warmes Wetter wäre, so what could I do, right? So that, that, that comes a second phrase, which is not of our concern today. It's just about what happens if I have a wish phrase. Um, so, um, Nikki, can you translate it, maybe? Um, if today weather was a little bit better, like mm -hmm. warmer? It's warmer, yes. Oh, if, if today would be a beautiful, uh, warm weather. For example, <coughs> I could say, wenn heute ein schönes, warmes <coughs> Wetter wäre, würde ich draußen tennis, <coughs> tennis spielen, right? If today would be a nice, beautiful weather, warm weather, I would play outside tennis. It means this is just about uh, wish phrases. Sorry, so wenn is, is closer to if, not when. Oh, Correct. depends. It could be as it could be also a conditional phrase, right? Because I could say that's a very good question. Because then could be translated into English and paraphrased into if or when. For example, look at this phrase. Wenn ich Hunger habe, koche ich. Gemüse. Gemüse means vegetables. Wenn ich Hunger habe, koche ich Gemüse. It doesn't need to be necessarily a uh, desire phrase. It could be also a conditional phrase. Wenn ich Hunger habe, koche ich Gemüse. Joseph, can you translate it? When I'm hungry, I cook vegetables. Exactly. Whenever I'm hungry, I cook vegetables. It doesn't need to be a wish phrase. Wish is one of the phrases that starts with then um, and could be translated into English by using if or when. The main, <coughs> the main point is that we have when at the beginning. And whenever we have when at the beginning, the verb comes at the end. And the next phrase starts with the verb also. We come to that in our future sessions. What happens with the main phrase, yes? So this Mm -hmm. still fall under the category of being, or is that? Yes, it's, it's still this one, yes. It means a desire or a conditional phrase. Okay, it could be a desire phrase or a conditional phrase because both, they share the same particle. They both start with them. So, I know you can actually bring a bunch of exercises and uh, examples when you at the beginning you have then and please again I have to emphasize it has nothing to do with the van with the a and double n which is a uh, interrogative uh, pronoun van kommst du nach Hause van gehst du nach Hause 
So that's a when question. This is when, and this is yeah, this, yes, that would be when question, and that is, that is, and, and that is the difference is that the question is with when, but this is not a question. So in English, there is a yeah, there is a homophonia because actually, uh, when could be a question, and when could be also a conditional pronoun. In German, we have a difference between van, which means when, at a time, question for a time, and then, which is conditional and subjunctive. Like if. Yes, it's like if, and like when also, right? Which is not a question. Okay. So, um, that was the second situation. It means starting phrases Basically, with uh, starting phrases with when, right? And if that could be one desire phrase, desire subjunctive, or it could be two conditional. which could means also, in English, could be pronounced by when or if, in English. So this is the situ second situation. The third situation, and maybe the most uh, popular um, situation, uh, uh, so within which we use phrases, at the, uh, phrases with verbs at the end, are related phrases. What are related phrases? They are the phrases that they always they be connected by, by using a relative pronoun. For example, and we know that we have actually these three articles, der, die, das, right? Which is masculine, feminine, neutral, and plural word would be also die. Giving an example, for example, I can say, the man, der, Deutsch, sprich. A very simple phrase. Der man, der Deutsch sprich. Tali, what does it mean? Uh, <coughs> excuse me, the man, Something speaks German, but I don't know the dare. The man, the Deutsch sprich. The goes back to the man. This is a relative pronoun whose reference is uh, always in gender, number, and case, the person that comes before. The man, he speaks German. The, the man who speaks who, German, uh, right? Is a relative pronoun. Why do you call it re relative pronoun? Because it relates to the previous phrase, always. And it has to represent in agreement the number, the, the gender, and the case of the uh, previous word. So since man here is masculine and singular and nominative and the subject, so the relative pronoun I'm, set, I'm, I'm setting after man has to be also the representative of representative of the masculinity, singularity, and subjectivity of the uh, phrase before. The man, the Deutsche sprich. Now, let's think what happens if my um, um, initial phrase starts with a female subject. Die Frau, die, Eine blaue Tasche. Eine blaue Tasche would be, would be one, right? <laughs> okay, eine blaue Tasche hat, right? <clears throat> die Frau, die eine blaue Tasche hat. Jessica, what could it mean? The woman who has the blue bag. Mm -hmm, exactly. As you see, <clears throat> here, sorry. <clears throat> Here, the reference to Frau is die, because Frau is feminine. Die Frau, die eine blaue Tasche hat. So, um, 
So this structure will be also the same if my subject would be neutral subject. For example, if I have a phrase like Das Kind Das sehr schnell rennt. Das Kind das sehr schnell rennt. Um, any idea what could it mean? A child who does something quickly. Run. run. Who runs quickly. Exactly. A child who runs very fast, very quickly. So it means here the same structure. King is neutral and das that comes after has to represent the gender, the case, and the number of the previous subject. If by any chance my initiated phrase starts with a plural phrase, that would be the same situation. I would, can, I would, I could say, the studenten, the in Los Angeles, Deutsch lernen. Die Studenten, die in Los Angeles, Deutsch lernen. Any idea what could it mean? Studenten who learn uh, German. German in Los Angeles. Exactly. Students who learn German in Los Angeles. As you see here, since Studenten is plural, <coughs> the, uh, the related pronoun to that is D. We come in future sessions talking about that, what, what happens if the initial phrase is not a subject, but an object. And so it has to also follow the case um, of the previous phrase. Um, all right, so uh, the confusing point here for any English speakers is that um, in all these cases, you have just one relative pronoun in English. It would be who or that, right? So in this per the first phrase, I would say the man who speaks German, the lady who has a blue bag, the child who runs very fast, who runs very fast, the students who learn um, German in Los Angeles. So it means in all these phrases, I have no other chance unless to create to to connect the first phrase to the second phrase by using the relative pronoun who or sometimes that. So while in, in German is much more uh, well, well established and it always reflects the subject, the, the gender of the subject, the case of the subject, and the number of the subject. So in lots of other European languages, the case, I mean, um, in, in, French would, in French would be the same like in, in German, in Italian would be the same, in Slavic languages, including Russian, would be the same, that you have always to reflect the gender, number, and the case of the previous uh, word that you had. In English, is quite fascinated because we use just who or that. So sometimes you could you, you could use also which, but uh, but it does not reflect the gender or the number or the case of the previous word. Okay, it means relative phrases is the third uh, category of those phrases that have their words at the end. It means, here as an abbreviation, just as a memo pad, I, we can write phrases with der, the, das. It means all phrases that come after der, die, das, and they would reflect the gender, number, case um, of the previous word. Finally, we have the Fourth category, the fourth category is so-called exclamation or, or exclamative phrases. The phrases we express when we are surprised, uh, when we are um, excited, and when we are impressed heavily by something. For example, like, and they often start with a uh, questional pronoun, like was, or in English like with what or how. For example, I can say, Was für eine 
ראשונה לומר. Was ist ein Mischung mit Blumen du hast? Right? What a beautiful flower you have. As you see, the, the work comes at the very end. Or? Was für ein Auf Gendes Leben Marks hatte. So the car marks, right? So, was für ein aufregendes, exciting. Was für ein aufregendes Leben Marks hatte. Right? So, what the um, um, life of full of excitement and ex what, a, what an exciting life uh, had the, the marks. Right? So, it is it's the call marks. So it means, as you see, whenever I want to express my um, astonishment, my being amused and um, being excited, I'm using um, an exclamative uh, sign at the end, and I start with a question, which is actually not a question, which is a rhetoric question. I really, I, I'm really not asking. I'm just surprised. I'm just uh, expressing my uh, my, my surprise. Or I can say, Welch schönes Haus du hast. Welch schönes Haus du hast. What a beautiful house you have. Exactly. Welch schönes Haus du hast. So it means, um, um, it's not, it doesn't need to be uh, necessarily just a boss. It could be another, um, actually, um, interrogative pronoun or, or interrogative adjective. Um, but in this case, it's not a question. It is rather a uh, surprise. Yes? What's the difference between Vesh and Vashmi? Was für is what, what for, mm -hmm. actually. And Vesh means, means uh, which word by word, but in translation into English you would say um, what a beautiful house you have and um, what, what, beauty, what a beautiful flower you have, actual flower you have. So it means in fact in translation properties into English often you have more flexibility to translate it to what for, right? Or what a... In German it's not the same. In German it's not the same. I mean if it's the same um, we would not use any another synonym, right? I mean that they are they are synonyms but they are not identical. So this was from Shuna was from Shuna Blume to has is what a beautiful flower you have, what a kind of, what a type of, where is which. So word by word means a uh, which beautiful house you have. But it, it wouldn't work in if you try to in English. You have to say what a beautiful house you have. But in, in German, welche is a, uh, or welche is a uh, um, interrogative adjective because it comes always with a noun. It, and, uh, but was is a pronoun, is not an adjective. So we come to that when, when we are talking about the differences between adjectives and adverbs <coughs> and pronouns. But just for now, you have to know that, that we are using this uh, interrogatives, this question words, but we don't mean it as question. We mean it actually as surprise. Fine? Okay, this is then the theory to, to our subordinated, pro subordinated process, phrases. So then, there is a final, um, 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 final um, actually category in which we are using verbs at the end. We had it last week. That's why I didn't add it here, but if in order just to have a complete session about uh, this uh, structure. So, so it was again, so I wiped it, so it would be the das phrases, right? The, the das, and these were actually phrases with pronouns. So it means was and 
very clear very clear or very clear and so on. And then let me add just a final um, actually category to this. There are so-called causative phrases. The causative phrases are actually phrases that talk and argue about why something happened. They bring a cause to your action. And they often start with a phrase that has at the beginning, at the head of the phrase, you have why, which means because. Whenever somebody would put the question why, warum, wieso, weshalb in German, and you want to answer why you did something, and you stop using the word why, you have to push the word toward the end of the phrase. For example, warum lernst du Deutsch? Warum lernst du Deutsch? This is a question, and I have to answer it with weil. So, ich lerne Deutsch, weil ich in Deutschland studieren möchte. Warum lernst du Deutsch? Ich lerne Deutsch, weil ich in Deutschland studieren möchte. Any idea what it, what it means? Because I like to study in Germany. Exactly. As you see, the words come at the end. And don't forget, if you have two pairs of words, it means a modal verb and the main verb, the modal verb in its conjugated verb comes at the very end. You see that? This has the actually the last position, and the second last position is the infinitive. So, it means that in a normal situation, I would say, ich möchte in Deutschland studieren. This is our not um, causative phrase. Ich möchte in Deutschland studieren. You see that, that in a normal phrase, I have the modal verb and then the main verb. But because I have this causative particle here, while, I have to push both words towards the end of the phrase. While the conjugated verb, möchte, comes at the very end, and the non-conjugated verb, the infinitive form, has the second last position. Warum lernst du in Deutschland? Ich lerne in Deutschland, weil ich in Deutschland studieren möchte. Let's try another phrase. I can ask, wieso, which means also why, or weshalb, which is also means why, and the classical warum. Warum bist du müde? Why are you tired? Now you want to answer, I'm tired because I didn't sleep, right? Last night. You will say, ich bin müde, comma, weil Ich letzte Nacht nicht geschlafen habe. Warum bist du müde? Wieso bist du müde? Was, weshalb bist du müde? Ich bin müde, weil ich letzte Nacht nicht geschlafen habe. So I didn't, I, I'm, I'm tired because last night I haven't slept. Because last night I didn't sleep. As you see, the, uh, the auxiliary verb habe, which is the conjugated form of the verb, comes at the end. And the participle comes before. Because the normal phrase would be, ich habe letzte Nacht nicht geschlafen. Right? The normal phrase without the causative particle at the beginning would be, 
Ich habe letzte Nacht nicht geschlafen. Right? Yes, you can add it. So, ich habe letzte Nacht nicht geschlafen. But now I'm bringing a cause to that, why I'm tired. So I have to push both words toward the end of the phrase. And I say, ich bin müde, weil ich letzte Nacht nicht geschlafen habe. So, um, and the last example maybe with an easier phrase. For example, I can ask, Warum gehst du nach Hause? Warum gehst du nach Hause? And you can say, I go home because I'm tired. So, ich gehe nach Hause, Komma, weil ich Müde bin. Right? The normal phrase would be, ich bin müde. Now I'm bringing the reason why I'm going home. Is a justification phrase. Warum gehst du nach Hause? Why do you go home? Why are you going home? Ich gehe nach Hause, weil ich müde bin. I go home because I'm tired. As you see, the word comes at the end of the phrase. So next to the word weil, which means because, and we have also another um, rather colloquial, um, vernacular particular that we are using for everyday speaking in German, which means also since or because. That is the word da, D-A. It has actually more or less the same meaning. So I can say, for example, ich arbeite viel, da ich Geld brauche. Ich arbeite viel, da ich Geld brauche. Brauchen means to need. Ich arbeite viel, da ich Geld brauche. Jessica, can you translate it? I work a lot because I need money. Exactly. Or since I need money, I work a lot. So it means da, you can translate it as since or because. In general, you can also use this uh, uh, so-called um, um, causative phrases at the beginning, and then you start with the main phrase. You know what? For example, you can say, da ich Geld brauche, arbeite ich viel. Right? In this case, you start uh, with, the, uh, with the causative um, particle or word, and you end the phrase with the verb, and you restart the second phrase with the verb also. So you would say, da ich, da ich Geld brauche, arbeite ich viel. So the verb comes always in the second position. So that was actually the, um, uh, the, the last category, the, the, or the last situation in which, in which or um, under which we use actually phrases with the verb at the end. So, so far, <coughs> the phrases starting with Bizu, Weshal, Bau. Excuse me, can you repeat the thing? So if you said, mm -hmm. da ich Geld brauche. Arbeite ich viel. Ah. It means if I end the phrase with, with verb, I have mm -hmm. to restart the second phrase also with a verb. But that's another category we are working on that later. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it.